subcommittee will come to order. I welcome you to this hearing of the Financial Services and General Government Subcommittee. Today's hearing is on election administration and will focus on the work we need to do to ensure that elections are secure, reliable, and accessible to all voters. This hearing is particularly timely since we are well into the 2008 primary season and a little more than eight months away from the November general election. We're anxious to hear what our witnesses will say about how the primary elections have proceeded and what issues or concerns have arisen. Will these primary elections be indicators of election administration successes or failures in the general election? What are the potential problems that we may face in the general election? We also want to use this hearing to learn more about the issues facing the Election Assistance Commission, including the funding requirements that will help the EAC meet its mission. This is a small agency with a very big responsibility. The EAC has an important role in giving guidance and information, providing regulatory authority over the National Voter Registration Act, and directing federal resources to support the conduct of elections at the state and local levels. More than $3 billion have been appropriated over the past six years to improve election administration and voting systems. Even with this commitment of federal resources, states continue to have critical unmet needs relating to ensuring that their elections run smoothly. The need is not more apparent than in the case of providing states with secure, reliable, and accessible voting systems. Touchscreen direct recording electronic voting machines were purchased by many states using money they received through Help America Vote Act programs. These machines were touted as the answer to election officials' prayers. Indeed, they offer the important benefits of accessibility and ease of use. But unfortunately, concerns have been raised about the reliability and security of these machines. Many states and their voters have lost confidence in them. Some states are reviewing their voting system requirements and are scrambling to modify or replace their systems to increase public confidence. It may be fair to say that no voting system is going to be 100% perfect, especially considering human factors that go into operating our polling places. However, we should continue to strive for an election process that has a minimum of confusion and error and a maximum of accurate results. Finally, I strongly believe that the often intense debate over election issues is due to the passion we share when it comes to protecting our democratic process and guaranteeing the right of every individual to cast a ballot in a <coughs> fair, open, and honest election. Our goal should be to ensure that we count every vote and make every vote count. I hope this hearing will help us to understand better how we can be more helpful to election officials in meeting that goal. Today, we welcome several witnesses who come before us to share their knowledge on election matters. On our first panel, we have from the Election Assistance Commission, Rosemary Rodriguez, the chair of the commission, <coughs> as well as commissioners Carolyn Hunter, Gracia Hillman, and Donetta Davidson. On our second panel, we will have Wendy Weiser of the Demo Democracy Program at NYU School of Law's Brennan Center for Justice, Susan K. Uron, Managing Director for State Policy Initiatives at the Pew Charitable Trust, Arturo Vargas, Executive Director of the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials Educational Fund, and Jeff Matthews, Director of the Star County, Ohio Elections Board. And we welcome all of our guests. We have a lot of material to cover, many people to hear from during this hearing, so I ask that each witness strictly, strictly, did I say that enough? Strictly observe a five-minute maximum for their opening statements. Your complete written statements will be submitted for the record. Also, I just want to remind members of the procedures we established last year questioning witnesses. We'll observe the five-minute rule, except for Mr. Regular, anything he wants. I'll recognize those members who are in the room at the time the hearing begins by seniority. Those members who went to the room after the hearing begin will, begins will be recognized in the order in which they arrived. I also intend to alternate between Democratic and Republican sides. We have two members of the committee, and I'll have Mr. Regula uh, mention their names. And with that, I turn to my trusted colleague and 
I don't know how my party's gonna feel about this, but on the list of people I wanted to retire from your side, you were not on my list. <laughs> you were not on my list. I appreciate You're one of the nicest people I know, and it's a pleasure working with you. Nice way to start the day. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think you've done a great job of summarizing the challenge that confronts us in this bill. Uh, and so I'll, I don't have much to add. I do want to welcome Mr. Bonner, who is a new member of this committee, and I think you'll find it very interesting and some rather challenging policy decisions that we have to make, starting with the one today. Uh, I'd like to welcome also our witnesses from the Election Assistance Commission. You know, elections are <coughs> such a great part of the American um, way that it's so important that people have confidence in the election process. And certainly voting is the method by which the American people select their representative, representatives in government. And if uh, democracy is going to thrive, uh, we have to, people have to believe in the integrity of the voting system and that every vote counts. Uh, we've had a couple elections back home where were maybe decided by one or two votes, and people say to me, my golly, my vote did make a difference. You know, it's easy to think when there's millions of people voting that your vote doesn't matter, but once in a while you see an election where it hinges on one or two <coughs> votes, and uh, therefore it's important that people believe in the integrity of the system and also that they participate. So that's what we're trying to do here, is create an environment where people will participate. It's amazing, there's over 100,000 polling places in our election system, and that's a challenge to ensure that there's integrity in each of these 100,000, because for the people that use them, that's their way to participate in their democracy. Uh, I look forward to your testimony and learning how you can have been and prospectively want to help to maintain the integrity of the election process and how we might improve it. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I, it's always a pri privilege to work with you. We've worked well together on issues last year and I know that we will again this year. And it's kind of interesting, uh, it's a sharp contrast. He's a big city boy from New York City and I'm a farm boy from Ohio. So you can't get much difference in the way of background contrast, but we're here as a team and we have done what everybody says it should happen and that is that we get along with each other and work together. So I, I look forward to the testimony. Thank you, it, it has been an experience for me. I came to Congress thinking all food came from a supermarket and, uh, <laughs> and it was wrapped there, you know, in cellophane and so on. I wanna welcome Mr. Rubensberger and Ms. Kilpatrick, <clears throat> just to remind you that at, uh, initially I said that we would recognize people uh, in the order that they came into the room for questioning. And uh, you know, wh when I look at this, this group before us, this panel, I'm always tempted to ask the question I've been asking for 34 years in public office in New York. And I, but I don't know if you do ballot placement. You know, New York has, the, the US Senate runs up here. Then you have all the local judges who cover the whole county of the Bronx come next. Then comes the member of Congress. And I've always said, why is the member of Congress not follow the, member of Congress follows the Senate in your state? In your state? And in New York? In New York, if you have 15 judges running who are usually supported by all three parties or four parties, they appear because they cover, these are statewide, Hillary or Chuck, right? These are countywide, and then this is district-wide. So I'm always 30% less of the vote by the time they get down to me. I don't know. It's a conflict of interest if I ask for anything special. Anyway, we... We should all be nice to Ms. Kilpatrick. The champions this year are probably gonna be the Detroit Tigers and, and, uh, you know, and, and not the Orioles or the Yankees, but anyway. Um, our first panel uh, is Ms. Rodriguez, Chair of the Commission, then we will recognize the Vice Chair, Ms. Hunter, followed by Ms. Hillman, and finally Ms. Davidson. 
Ms. Rodriguez, welcome. Welcome to all of you, and please. There must be enough ballots, voting machines, and poll workers to serve the crush that will surely show up in November. A contingency plan is also a must because in elections, things don't always go as planned. At the EAC, we are providing tools and information to assist election officials, poll worker guides, information about how to design a ballot, and a series of management guides to help them effectively manage the entire process. <clears throat> from voting system security all the way through ballot tabulation. While election officials have a lot on their plates, the EAC faces challenges of its own. Congress provided $115 million in new funds to the state. Thank you for that. Can states use that to, to replace touch screen equipment? The Help America Vote Act, or HAVA, says that voting systems purchased with funds appropriated after 2007 must be fully accessible. What systems are considered accessible to individuals with disabilities? Mr. Chairman, as you know, the EAC does not mandate, endorse, or recommend one voting system over another. It is the spirit and intent of HAVA that the states make voting system decisions based upon which will best serve the individual state. That is why I have proposed a reversal of EAC guidance. My proposal asserts that it is reasonable pursuant to the Office of Management and Budget Circulars for state governing jurisdictions to use HAVA funds to replace voting systems purchased with HAVA funds as long as such funds comply with HAVA. Our Inspector General recently released a review of EAC's operations and financial controls. Clearly, there are changes that must be made at the EAC, and the IG's report provides us with a roadmap to make those changes. We have already gotten started, but we have much to do. These challenges have not stopped the EAC from fulfilling some of its most important mandates, including launching the federal government's first voting system certification program and issuing voluntary voting system guidelines. I am the chair of this commission, and I take this responsibility very seriously. I am very aware that what happens in 2008 will be on my watch. I assure you that the EAC will focus on its responsibilities under the law and make sure that Congress and the public are fully informed about our activities. Thank you again for having us here today, for your support of the EAC, and for your support of the <coughs> voters of America. We look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Hunter? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Serrano, Ranking Member Regula, and the other subcommittee members. Thank you for asking us to be with you today. As Chairwoman Rodriguez mentioned, one of EAC's mandates under the Help America Vote Act is the adoption of the Voluntary Voting System Guidelines. The guidelines provide a set of specifications and requirements against which voting systems can be tested to determine if they provide all of the basic functionality, accessibility, and security capabilities required of voting systems. HAVA transferred this responsibility from the FEC to the EAC. The EAC adopted its first version in 2005, and we are in the <coughs> beginning of the process to adopt the next iteration of the VVSG. HAVA clearly defines the process for adopting these guidelines. Our Technical Guidelines Development Committee and the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, provide EAC with an initial draft. Then the EAC adopts the final version. However, the road to adopting a final version will include widespread input, public meetings, and public comments. As a matter of fact, we've already scheduled a series of roundtable discussions with a wide variety of stakeholders. All of these discussions are open to the public. The EAC has implemented a very thorough, inclusive, and transparent public comment process. We have already begun the first comment period for the initial version and provided the public with a very user-friendly online comment tool. 
At the end of the comment period, the EAC will consider every comment and issue our own draft version. At that point, there'll be another 120-day comment period. Again, the public will be able to submit comments as well as view every comment that has been submitted, and the EAC will continue to work with NIST throughout this process. The draft guidelines are a complete re rewrite of the 2005 guidelines intended to address the next generation of voting systems. They contain new and expanded material in the areas of reliability, quality, usability and accessibility, security, and testing. According to the Help America Vote Act, adoption of the guidelines at the state level is voluntary. However, states may formally adopt the VVSG, which would of course make these guidelines mandatory in those jurisdictions that choose to adopt them. We often get asked what value voluntary guidelines provide. The answer is simple. They provide a base level of conformity testing that election officials can rely on. States have the flexibility to apply the parts of the guidelines that make sense in their jurisdiction or to not use them at all. The EAC is also operating the federal government's first voting system certification program. And let me address two issues that come up frequently. One issue is vendors paying labs directly. That's the way the process is working at this moment. The vendors can choose their own labs and pay the labs for the cost of testing. The EAC is not authorized to pay the labs. Some have argued that the EAC should do so and the EAC should cho choose the lab to make a little bit more of a distance between the vendor and the lab but the EAC is not authorized to do so. Any funds that we collect must be turned over to the Treasury unless we have a specific authorization, such, such as an authorization to redistribute Section 102 funds. To, al to allow EAC to take this responsibility, it would require Congress to take action. As we've stated in the past, co if Congress wishes to take this action, we stand ready to assist. The second issue I'd like to, to bring up is that the Help America Vote Act did not give the EAC any authority over voting systems we have not certified. And at this point, as you know, the EAC has not certified any voting systems. So it's, it's very likely that there will not be any systems in use during the 2000 election cycle that were certified by the EAC. And so therefore, we have no authority to regulate those machines. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Hillman. Good morning, Chairman Serrano ranking member regular and members of the committee. <clears throat> Let me begin by saying that I have the distinction of having served on the commission since it was established in 2003. Mr. Chairman, most local election officials are resource challenged to plan and run their election day activities. As you know, EAC must provide a range of assistance to states. There are thousands of election officials who work the front lines in our quest for accurate, fair, and accessible elections. I will briefly describe some of our programs that provide assistance to their work. An urgent need is adequate numbers of highly trained poll workers. EAC has helped election officials tackle this challenge in two ways. We produced documents that provide effective and affordable practices for the recruitment, training, and retention of poll workers. These resource manuals are now in the hands of election officials. Secondly, Mr. Chairman, you and this committee have recognized the value of preparing the next generation for community service at the polls. Since 2004, EAC has run two college poll worker programs and produced a guide for recruiting students. As a result, more than 3,000 college students in three dozen communities have joined the ranks of America's champions of democracy. EAC also looks forward to the opportunity to directly operate the mock election program. This program will provide opportunities for high school students to have firsthand experiences with a mock election process. Equally challenging for election officials is the effective design of voting materials. You mentioned uh, a design on a ballot. Ballot design flaws made front page news in 2000, 2006, and even this year during the California primary. Last year, EAC produced and distributed sample materials and best practices for effective designs. 
More details about these materials are provided on pages 11 and 12 of our written testimony. But let me just quickly mention that the materials we produced are camera-ready images. I mentioned earlier that election officials are resource-challenged, and when EAC produces materials, we try to do it in a way that is very affordable and practical for the election officials. The information is available in different languages, and we are hoping that it will serve as a useful resource to election officials. Once the election is over, Mr. Chairman, we need to know more than who was elected. EAC uses election day statistics to measure progress and improvement. We conduct a biennial election day survey, and the resulting reports include information about uniformed and overseas citizens voting and registration under the National Voter Registration Act. As we work to fine tune our data collection efforts, we acknowledge the value of the $10 million in grant funding that was appropriated in this fiscal year. The grants will be awarded this spring for pilot projects in five states. Through this program, EAC and election officials will be able to explore the requirements, challenges, and solutions for collecting data at the precinct level. These results will be reported to Congress in June of 2009. Information about all of EAC's programs, including our 2008 grant programs, can be found on our website at www.eac.gov. The Help America Vote Act calls for significant improvements. Some simply take more time than others. EAC recognizes that challenges remain. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the committee's continued interests in accomplishments under HAVA and your continued support of EAC. I also look forward to continuing this dialogue and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Davidson. Good morning, Mr. Chairman Serrano and Ranking Member Rugula and subcommittee. I thank you for this opportunity this morning. I am a former Secretary of State, and my priority is providing election officials with real-world tools and solutions to effectively manage their elections. Secure, accurate, accessible elections are a complex process com uh, comprised of many moving parts and many moving people. And they only work one time a year in some instances. We hear a lot about certain voting systems if they are trusted. In fact, any voting system, a ballot box, a direct record, or a scanned machine can be compromised if you have two things. If you have access to that system and if you have knowledge of that system. I spent my entire career in elections and some things never change. Whether it is a voter using a paper ballot, a touch screen, details matter. It is just as important to make sure that voting equipment is working properly as it is to have procedures and well-trained people to control access to maintain the equipment properly. That's why the EAC, <coughs> uh, excuse me, that is why the EAC has established the Election Management Guideline Program, which provides material to election officials to help them manage the entire process. So far, we have issued information on the following topics polling places and vote centers, managing change in an election office, media and public relations, absentee voting and voting by mail, acceptance testing of the equipment, voting system certification, voting system security, poll workers, ballot preparation, printing and pre-election testing, new voting systems, and contingency and disaster planning. Let me speak briefly about the importance of the contingency planning this year. The turnout has been high, as we know. And in November, we expect a very high turnout. That is the great problem to have. But in the meantime, we must make sure that our election officials are prepared, that they have enough ballots, they have enough poll workers, they also have the voting equipment that they need to make sure that the record number of voters can move through the polling locations. 
Management material, as we call them, quick starts, have been distributed to more than 6,000 election officials throughout the nation. We continue to receive requests asking for more when they are conducting their training sessions. In the near future, we will have material about serving the elderly and the disabled in long-term facilities, military voting, and how to audit the entire election process. The EAC also has helped election officials assist with the language uh, accessibility needs. Our language accessibility program is very a, a very large portion of our uh, new website, and we've translated it into Spanish, as well as our voter registration is translated into Spanish. In, me in May, the EAC will offer a glossary, just like the Spanish one, in five Asian languages, as well as provide website information in those languages and the national form. All of this material to, from the EAC to help election officials manage their elections is free at no cost, and we provide it to everyone. As a former election official who has watched the formation and the involvement and the evolution of HAVA very closely, the EAC is providing exactly the kind of assistance and support the law envisioned. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, I thank all of you for a wonderful testimony, notwithstanding the fact that none of you spoke about my ballot placement problem in New York. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're gonna take that up locally. Um, I just asked Mr. Regular how long he's been in public office, and he told us 49 years. And I've been in public office 34. I don't think that during my lifetime I've seen turnouts the way I've seen already this year. And I don't speak for Mr. Regular, but I venture to say he probably doesn't remember recent times having this kind of turnout. And <clears throat> it doesn't look like it's going to stop. On the Republican side, there's obvious excitement. No national poll indicates that anybody is going to trounce the other person. On the Democratic side, the excitement of the possibility of the first woman or the first African-American president. Immigrants who've joined the ranks as American citizens who found out that it's important once they get the citizenship to start voting. Students have not been excited, this excited, in my opinion, since the anti-war protests that, that brought me into politics. This is all wonderful, but this is scary. Are we ready? Or are we gonna spend two weeks after an election trying to find out who the next president will be? So with that in mind, and I know you touched on some of the things, uh, Ms. Davison, uh, what are the top priorities that need to be accomplished before November? And how are you working with the states? What role are you playing with the states to make sure that these things are in place? We, on one hand, we have this excitement, which is good for the democracy. We can run the risk of having people upset at how the results came about or in doubt as to what the result has been. That would, I think, just do a complete turnaround <coughs> on the excitement and hurt the democracy in a way that it can't hurt. So what needs to be done before 08, in your opinions? And what are you doing working with the states and how far along are we in making sure that we get a good election uh, operation, if you will, uh, in November? Uh, I, I'll start if it's okay. Sure. sure. <coughs> We are, the EAC is going everywhere. Uh, we're scattered all over the country, meeting with election officials and promoting the uh, conting contingency uh, planning aspects of, of our programs. We, uh, uh, Commissioner Hunter was in Casper, Wyoming. Uh, Commissioner Davidson was in Kentucky last week. We will go anywhere in the country to train election officials on the importance of contingency planning. I think that's the, the, our big message this year, to expect record turnout and to prepare for it, sub substantively, with enough ballots, machines, and poll workers. And I'm Now, I know you're, 
I know that part of your role is, is to, as you deal with these issues, tell us, you know, we're going to do it right and everything's going to get done right. But if you were an advocate for better elections, what would you be fearful of right now looking at, at, at November? What do you think may not be in place that makes you nervous? Well, again, I, I'm from Colorado. I would, as an advocate, I would want my state to have an, the election plan in place. And uh, there are several states who don't have a plan in place yet uh, because of uncertainty about the, uh, the, the voting systems that their legislatures uh, want them to use. Are there many states like that? I, I think there's, a ha there's definitely a handful. Yeah. Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, if I, yes. <coughs> sure. if I might just say that <coughs> if I were an advocate, I guess there would be a couple of specific things. One would be how the state is implementing the statewide voter registration database, the voter registration lists, so that when people show up at the polls or even before election day, they know that they are on the roll properly and they know which precinct uh, they are to report to. I, I always encourage election officials to meet with the advocate groups early and often so that each knows what the other is doing, so that election officials know the level of activity for voter registration uh, and what kind of uh, increase in voter registration to expect. And we certainly would hope, given some of the experiences in the recent primaries, that election <coughs> officials would understand it is better to send more ballots, more materials to polling places, than to budget on last year's turnout, because that's just not working right now. And therefore, <coughs> provisional ballots are being used in ways that they weren't envisioned, which is if you run out of a ballot then you must use the uh, provisional ballot. Unfortunately, some states uh, and locals aren't, jur aren't budgeted to have more machines, but certainly I would think that putting more machines in a polling place than previous uh, would be one way to cut down on uh, lines. Okay. Yes. I think there's one other issue that we all need to be prepared for, maybe a couple, is one is the printing of the ballots. There is a lot of ballots being printed now, and we must make sure that um, that there's enough printers and that they can get the ballots to the election officials timely. That is one of the concerns and make sure that there is a process put into place to make sure that the ballots, timing bar hasn't slipped so the ballots will read on election night, not holding up the process as we've seen in some states of getting results. And I will say that the more... Um, now, you, you said there are ballots being printed now? No, no. Oh, okay. But, you know, yeah. uh, we that's don't know. the problem. We don't know who's running yet. Yeah, I was going to say, Certainly that's the problem. on this side, we don't if, know. If we had that magical <laughs> ball, we would know the ballot, and we could print them now, and it wouldn't have the problem. As you are aware, the, the list of candidates and issues for a ballot comes very late. Right. So there's a, a very short time frame to print ballots. That's our concern, is enough... Ballots could be printed immediately so that the election officials have them and there is a process put into place to make sure they're printed correctly. And also that the states really look at it and make sure that, that the design is properly done so that voters won't miss a, an office or whatever the case might be. Thank you. I think what we can do to the extent we're able to is help voters to determine in advance, and I think Commissioner Hillman mentioned this, where they're supposed to go on election day. And when they wait till the last minute to find that information out, they probably will get a busy signal or they'll have a bit of a hard time finding out that information. So I think we should help voters with a lot of great resources that are out there today that weren't, maybe even four years ago, to determine where they're supposed to go on election day. Okay, I, I would hope that as, as we move forward here, you, you keep the committee uh, informed of what new uh, issues come up uh, so that we can all be part of this informational process. You, you, your point is well taken. One of the biggest issues I know during all the campaigns I've been involved in, the, 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 big, the largest amount of questions is calling campaign headquarters, whatever, where do I vote? You know, it, people, uh, and, and things get changed, and they're not told that there was change from the last place they went to. Uh, let me move on to, to very quickly to another issue. Um, in 2007, the EAC substantially edited a commission research report on voter fraud and intimidation, changing an analysis that concluded that voter <coughs> fraud is rare 
After much criticism from Congress and others about the lack of transparency at the agency, the AC released the original draft report to the committee and directed its inspector general to review its procedures. The IG's report is expected in the near future. What changes to internal policies and procedures have been implemented or are being considered to ensure that EAC's work, including work done by researchers on the contract, is open and transparent? Will all research funded with tax dollars be available to the public? Anyone or all? Well, um, two things that we've done is we have changed the language we use. We will either accept or adopt a report, and they mean very different things. If a consultant is doing preliminary study for us and presents us with a report, we accept it. We post it on our website. It's available as presented to us um, for anybody in the public uh, to see. Additionally, we are re-looking at how we as a small agency can incorporate the multitude of responsibilities for uh, overseeing contracts. I mean, the federal government is replete, as you know, um, with requirements, and small agencies are often challenged to be able to follow all those things through so that we don't inadvertently um, uh, take a misstep. Uh, and the other thing is that we will um, use our uh, standards board and our board of advisors uh, frequently uh, as sounding boards to help us as we work our way through uh, how we approach research projects. Okay. Anyone else? Just, uh, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, as the chair, I don't ever want to be accused of burying anything uh, again, and uh, I think we can commit to you that that we won't be subject to those accusations. Well, that's important. That was a pretty uh, embarrassing situation for a lot of folks, and it was a very difficult situation. And it, it, it came on early in the work that you do, and it created a, a feeling that maybe we couldn't get the information we needed. And so that's something that we have to deal with, and I appreciate your comments. I will now recognize Mr. Regular, and after that, we'll make the committee uh, members angry by sticking to the five-minute rule. Mr. Regular. <laughs> after Mr. Regular. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what was your impression of the 2006 elections? Did the process work? And did the advice that's available in these various publications uh, prove useful in ensuring that the election <laughs> process was done accurately and in a way that the public could understand it? Being a new agency, um, the 2006, really, at that time, we were trying to get out and, and, and educate our public as we know we should again this time. And as you say, education is great, whether we educate you so you can help educate the public is wonderful. Uh, and we appreciate all the help because it definitely getting the word out to public is very important. But in 2006, we didn't have our, uh, a lot of our work done, uh, you know, there was some, but it was very small. We have done a lot since 2006. In 2006, it was started. In 2007, a lot of it was complete. And as you've heard, by spring this year, we will have a lot more of it even up. Our website is full of information that we hope and we try to educate the election people because many of our election officials come from small jurisdictions. Getting that information down to them, to that level, is very important. That's why we see it's such a, a need of education, whether it is the press, and last year we tried to educate the press. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And having the agency being as new as it was in 2006 and trying to get out information, we feel we've made great strides of, of improving on what we had started in 2006 to make it better for 2008. Um, we saw problems that we're never going to have a perfect election. We have over a million poll workers throughout the nation. And when we put it into a million people's hands, human error is what we find is our biggest problem. So that's why we were so uh, glad that we had the study, which took us over a year to do on the poll workers, on educating of the poll workers. So that we're always hurting to get poll workers Number one. Did your studies show how we can get more? Uh, they gave us great ideas, yes. We pulled in uh, election officials that's been 
very successful in getting poll workers to recruit them from whether it is from a corporate world, whether it is from the parties, whether it is from um, any organization, even a, a nonprofit organization, how they can be of help and really serve as a poll worker. So we're trying very hard. Is it still a pros problem in our nation? Absolutely. We have it throughout the nation of trying to find poll workers, and we have election officials at the very last minute still scrambling to have enough. Is your experience that employers will help? It's kind of like jury duty, that they'll encourage their employees to participate? In some jurisdictions, they're very willing to help, but in others, they're, um, they've not been, the election officials not been as successful of getting the polling workers from the, uh, the business world. Absentee ballots, it's my impression at least that more people are voting absentee. Is that an accurate, uh, and maybe this contributes to the volume of voting because it's easier to do it. Uh, if you're looking at me, I'd be well, more than happy. Um, yes, in a lot of states there is more absentee. Um, there's there's a more of a volume, but in so far, absentee hasn't shown that it's turned out more of an increase in voters. Um, but we do have more people voting absentee. A lot of the western states, California, has gone to permanent absentee now. So in moving that direction, in a lot of states, we see that the turnout of an absentee will be higher. Do your guidelines help to preclude any voter fraud? Because there are always allegations that there's voter fraud in some jurisdictions. Do you, do you think following the guidelines that you provide will help to preclude that happening? Any one of you would like I, to? I All right, attempt Madam that. Chairman. Uh, the uh, HAVA requires that at the point of registration, uh, uh, identification uh, is demonstrated by the, by, at the registration point. Um, and states have a variety of ways to, uh, to match the voter with um, th that voter's record and, and polling place. Uh, some states require identification. Um, uh, some states require uh, government-issued picture identification. Some states require <coughs> Uh, if, the, if the voter doesn't have that, something else. So it's a, it's a hodgepodge, again, uh, uh, like everything else in elections, uh, it's a state-by-state state requirement. Um, the EAC uh, has not uh, issued a, a one-size-fits-all policy or guidance on identification. Well, since obviously elections are local control or state control, do you think we should have any greater amount of mandatory requirements uh, coming out of the federal process? Uh, that would be uh, your decision, <laughs> the Congress's decision. Um, what would you recommend? <laughs> I couldn't, I, could, I don't have a consensus position from the EAC at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what is permanent absentee? Permanent absentee is your name, once you require a ballot by absentee, your name stays on a list okay. and unless you fail to vote, they automatically send an absentee ballot okay. to your home at that address Makes or sense. until it comes back undeliverable and then they take your name off of that permanent list. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Kilpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. I like the female board I see in front of me. We don't get that often here, so it's a pleasure to have you all here again uh, this morning. Thank you very much for coming. This is perhaps, and your responsibility this year, since you were started in 02, I believe, and then late, took a year or so before you got set up. We didn't appropriate you properly. You did the best you can do, and I want to commend you for the job that you've done uh, over these now five years. This election, some, what is this, the second month, nine months away, will really determine whether all that we've done since we've been, you know, instituted the EAC and all is going to be what we hoped it would be. So I want to ask you that you ask us for absolutely everything that you need. I, I think, uh, Ms. Hillman, your points were well taken as one of my colleagues asked the question, you know, how do we get an accurate election? All voters 
can vote and all votes be counted. How do you get the education started now in our local communities? And I think the chair mentioned that some places don't even have plans yet. We have to be your partners in this and we don't expect you to do it by yourself. But the voter registration lists, I mean, those are just absolutely necessary. Meeting with the advocacy groups, often and soon, necessary. People need to know now where they vote, not in July, not in September, certainly not in November, what kinds of one, two, threes can we do and as your partners, as members of Congress? We all represent 650, 700,000 people apiece, and we need to be joined so that we might be able to help you get this done, because in a minute, we're gonna point at you guys when we, in fact, could have been much more helpful. Um, the ballot, the, you know, the ballots themselves, the number of machines, we know now it's going to be more than ever because of what we're seeing already this year and as we go through the rest of the year, I'm sure. What kinds of things that we do now, M Madam Secretary of State, you mentioned, and it's unfortunate, and I'm a former state legislator as well, you can't print the ballot till you know who the candidates are. So okay, presidential is one thing, but it also happens locally and statewide. Maybe we ought to have a cutoff period or something in the state. We gotta get real creative this year, and I hope for the rest of our lives as more and more people come into the process and vote more and have our processes set up. What can we do together? Ask for it. I don't care what OMB said. I mean, you know, I, you gotta <laughs> ask for it. And we gotta help you get it. Uh, the appropriation is important. Getting it out to the states is more important and seeing that every voter who wants to vote votes and is counted. I don't, we won't blame you, they can blame me. Not even the chairman, I'll take the rap for you. But we gotta, we gotta make sure that, that there's enough machines and ballots and uh, even the structure of the ballots. Sometimes they're too difficult, you know. I, I, I'm leading something, I'm asking for something, and I don't know, I just want your opinion in general or anything that I can work on particularly or we can work on as a caucus or the House and Senate. Madam Vice Chair. I think you bring up some excellent points and I think we all agree with everything you just said. Uh, as you know, the Help America Vote Act is structured in such a way that, that the federal government has a role, of course, per the Help America Vote Act, but essentially many of the decisions that you discussed are made at the state and local level because of course not every state thinks that there should be a uniform process and different states have different requirements, different issues. For rural communities there are completely different issues than for, for the chairman's jurisdiction in Brooklyn. So I think that's important to keep in mind. You know, the, the, the way that the Help America Vote Act has been working is that the Congress appropriated Three, three billion dollars, as you know, and now an additional 115 for the states to spend, essentially as they see fit. There are not very strict requirements on how they spend that, that money. And so what we're doing, is, as some of us have discussed this morning, is providing some voluntary guidelines for them to say, you know, with the money that Congress has appropriated to you, you might want to be creative on getting poll workers. You know, go to the local universities, do things differently, because we all anticipate high turnout, and you have to be prepared to have all these things in place. So I think, I think what we're trying to do is pr to provide that guidance that states may may not have the resources to do the research themselves to use that guidance to make sure their election runs as smoothly as they can. And all of us participated in some meetings here a few weeks ago in Washington with state and local election officials. And, and they stand ready. They, they understand that the participation levels will be greatly increased. They, they know the pressures on their jobs. Many of them are, you know, live under a microscope that they never imagined in the past. So they are, I, I believe most of them are prepared, they are ready, and they are willing to do whatever it takes. May I, I'd like to add a couple of points. We, we election officials need help recruiting poll workers, and, and members of Congress have the, the identification uh, with the voters and could be real, uh, real leaders in that effort. Um, the election officials need help with their appropriating authorities. County commissioners sometimes can't get the, leg the uh, attention of the legislature. And so a letter from a member of Congress with an appropriation request uh, might, might tip the balance in favor of an election. Well, for example, um, uh, in order to better serve uh, the voters in a county, uh, they, they might need some additional funds. And so if, if that local official had a member of Congress in their corner, I'll bet they would get the attention of the legislature uh, right. better, better get that attention. So perhaps now members of Congress need to be working closely with their states and elected officials to 
vet out some of this to see where we might work and partner together. You stated my point exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you might give us a guideline on how we can be helped. Yeah. Well, maybe that's one of the publications right. you ought to put out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I would just add one thing is to make sure that state legislators are more engaged in harbor requirements, because often state legislators don't understand. And when the Secretary of State goes for an appropriation, like the 5% match that's required for the $115 million to be dispersed, and if state legislatures drag their feet and don't get it done, that means the state is delayed in receiving its funds. I would like to put one thing on the table in response to your question, and let me say, Congresswoman, thank you very much for recognizing the struggles EAC has and the work that we've been doing. But for the long term, but it, long term, all things are relative. Let's say if we look down the road to 2012, two things could very nicely come together. The Election Assistance Commission is working on, as was uh, mentioned earlier, our guidelines for voting systems the next generation. I think Congress can do a lot to end the concern and debate about what's a good voting system. The manufacturers need some incentive, some encouragement to come to the table. And I think it would be appropriate for Congress to consider some funding for some innovations so that the manufacturers will step up to the plate. My guess is in 2002, Congress thought we'd be a lot further along with respect to what's an accessible machine and what's available in the market. And election officials can only purchase what's in the market. And they get scared when a manufacturer says, if you want that, we can do it, but it's going to cost several thousand more. So as Congress did, like with the orphan drug issue, the, the people who purchase voting systems, that's a relatively small constituency. But if Congress gave, put out some money for innovation, for research and testing so that we can have the kind of voting systems that will well serve America, so that we won't have calibration issues, so that we won't have confusion over software, so that we won't have the kind of systems uh, that cause people concern. Thank you. We have less than five minutes on a vote, so we're going to take a break. Uh, it's one vote and come back and resume our questioning of this panel. Thank you. <coughs>
had we finished uh, all the comments on that last question? Yes, we had. I believe so. Yes, then the... Well, uh, there would have been one other thing, and it sounds mundane, but it's very important to us. The Election Assistance Commission is subject to the Paperwork Reduction Act, which means for any project we do where we have to collect information from the states, we have to go through that process, which adds 90 to 120 days uh, to whatever project we do. So if this committee asked us today to collect data available to them by April 1st, we probably couldn't do it unless we got total exemption. So we do request consideration that EAC, like the FEC, can be exempt from the Paperwork Reduction Act. It would allow us to meet the every two year deadline cycles that we ha have to prepare for elections. That's a good point, and the uh, committee will certainly take that up. I think that's only a fair uh, request. I hope voting machines are not held under that uh, provision, <laughs> paper reduction. The uh, <laughs> committee is, uh, <coughs> committee will now recognize the newest member of our committee, gentleman from Brooklyn, New York, right? <laughs> that accent is from Brooklyn, New York, I assure you. <laughs> Mr. Good from the great state of Virginia. I'm sorry, Mr. Good. With all due respect, Mr. Bonner was next, and um, and I had promised him that if he hurried back, he would be next. Gentleman from Alabama, he also has a Brooklyn accent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little winded. This is my first day on the committee and my first day on the subcommittee, and I'm honored to join both. In, in many ways, it's very appropriate that the question I might ask of this distinguished panel uh, has to do with the brave men and women uh, around the world who allow us to meet today uh, in freedom. Many states face challenges to ensure that our servicemen and women overseas are able to effectively participate in the election process. My home state of Alabama alone has some 19,000 men and women in uniform who claim Alabama is their residence, and all 50 states can make similar claims. These are men and women defending our freedoms and helping to spread the right to vote many times to oppress people around the world, and they are practically prevented from having their voted votes counted in our own elections. GAO has suggested that the Department of Defense create a plan for future electronic voting. Our own Secretary of State in Alabama, Beth Chapman, would like to see Alabama participate in a pilot program with DOD to provide secure voting over the Internet for members of our military and other Americans who reside overseas. I've been told that we're waiting on the Election Assistance Commission to help develop guidelines so such a program uh, could work. Can, can you give us some thoughts about what we can do to ensure, especially this year, if we are looking at record votes being cast and counted here in our own country, how can we make sure that the people who allow us to stay free have their votes counted as well? Thank you, Commissioner Davidson. <coughs> I will start with it and uh, hopefully the others will add because I'm sure I'm going to leave something out that's very important. But it, we have dedicated a portion of our website to the military and overseas voters that we give links to whether it is the military branches, all the military branches, to the Overseas Vote Foundation, which is a nonprofit, as well as NAS and to other organizations that uh, that we can give information out about uh, so that the overseas uh, people know what their state laws are and how they can meet the needs. The other thing that we are doing, we are working with NIST in developing guidelines. Um, we did a study that took a year and a half in doing this study about what works best throughout the nation. Um, and I believe it was four or six states, I'm not sure, that we did this study with. In doing that study, it's getting ready to come out what you know best practices for the military and, and the overseas voting. And the other thing that we did is we did a study of the actual 
overseas and military, the, what did they like and how did they like to go about voting? And that, we had 5,000 individuals reply to that survey. And that survey, we're just getting ready to put that out. We've just received that in from the contractor. So it's being reviewed right now and we'll get comments from our locals as we uh, always do try to put it out to our states and get comments. So we are on the move in trying to get the, uh, having NIST really develop those studies. They are they're moving forward to, uh, to actually, first of all, make sure that they transmit the ballot over safely and be able to get it back safely. So electronic transmission and then move into internet itself because there is more of a, um, issues in the internet voting than there is transmitting it and having them mail it back. But at least if we can eliminate the travel time of a ballot over and for them to be able to mail it back like most states are doing, then that's great. But we also are having states that's moved forward and are, are actually transmitting it back electronically. So there's, um, we have two states I believe it's Arizona and Washington states that are vote, uh, that are registering people online if they have a driver's license. That also helps them in the overseas voting because uh, if they are registering them, they have moved forward for they are also looking into receiving the ballot back electronically. The security of that ballot is what we're most in, you know um, concerned about and making sure that individual has their right to the ballot and nobody else. So obviously we want to work as fast as we can, but as, uh, make sure that we actually address all the issues that we can. And so we are moving forward and we're working with uh, <coughs> the, um, the Federal Voters Assistance, uh, Polly Benelli, in doing this, and we're moving forward with her as well as with NIST. We have done an intergovernmental agreement with the two agencies, so all three of us are working together. So is it safe to say that this commission can give assurance to the military men and women that we're doing everything we can to ensure that their votes will count? It, Mr. Bonner, yes, it is a pr very high priority of this commission to enable that. Um, <clears throat> But, but I think I'd like to just add that, that states are doing some of their own great ideas, and, and Florida is one of them. One of the counties there took it upon themselves to, to create a pilot program to allow voters to be able to, to vote actually overseas in, in certain locations. And, and I know the secretary from Alabama is hosting a conference on this issue in the next two weeks. <coughs> so I think while, while it is true that NIST is working on standards to be able to vote via the Internet, I hope states don't wait for that because it may take some time. And I think when you really look at the issue, as, as um, Commissioner Davidson said, the issue is the transmission of the ballots. And because the ballots are printed somewhat late in the process, you know, the election officials aren't able to mail them until the ballots are ready, of course. And it's a very small window of time. And when you just think it's only about mailing things, it seems so <coughs> obvious that one of the best ways to fix it is through some kind of electronic transmission. And I think that we should be able to come up with guidelines for states that they can use to transmit these ballots securely. Thank Mr. You. Bonner, if I just might add that while the EAC has been asked to study the issue and come up with guidelines, I think we do have to acknowledge that the Federal Voting Assistance Program at the Department of Defense has enormous responsibility for helping states find the military personnel who have moved and where what their addresses are. Uh, and so that's a big piece of this as well. Could I have one more thing? There is one problem that we have with, the, with it is the law, the federal law says that Absentee ballots to the overseas and military is left it on at that address unless they're notified. And as we know, our military move around a lot. We're getting a lot of those ballots back for at the state and local level that uh, is not addressed properly because the military has moved. So that is one of our problems of having correct information and we're working with uh, them trying to get that and, and we may come once we have better information, we may come back to you and say, we definitely need some help in some law changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Bonner. Now here's a question for Mr. Crumb. Mr. 
state of Florida. The blue state is way ahead. I did. Yes, thank you. And we, we are, and, uh, but that is after eight years of struggling to, to get to this point. And I might add that uh, the Election Assistance Commission was created as a result of the uh, Help America Vote Act, which resulted directly from the travesty that occurred in, in the uh, election year, presidential election of 2000. Um, uh, Madam Chair, my question is for you. Uh, my series of questions will be for you, and i uh, be happy to have any others chime in while, uh, while you're at it. But, Mr. Chairman, I would like to um, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a uh, first-person account by Tova Andrea Wang that was published in the Washington Post on August 30th of 2007. Madam Thank you. Tova Wang um, and Job Sereboff were commissioned by the e EAC to conduct a study about voter fraud and intimidation. Is that correct? Uh, and my question is directed to you, Madam Chair. Okay, I'm, I'm the vice chair, but uh, I'll be happy directed. to answer your question. No, I would like my question directed to the chair. Yes, yes, ma'am, that's correct. Thank you. And they wrote this in partnership together to provide partisan balance, is that correct? Yes. Their research found widespread agreement among administrators, academics, and election experts from all points on the political spectrum that allegations of fraud through imperson voter impersonation at polling places was greatly exaggerated, and that was in the draft that was submitted to your commission in initially, correct? Yes. After submitting the draft in July 2006, Ms. Wang was barred by the, and, and her co-author were barred by the commission staff from having anything more to do with, that, with, with the project. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Why was that? I'm sorry, why was Why were they barred from having anything more to do with the project after they submitted their draft? They, uh, the EAC accepted the draft and they, uh, at the time, were uh, classified as contract employees and uh, the EAC. But why wouldn't you want the expertise of the authors when you were going forward and mo moving forward with the production of the final report? Um, I, as I wasn't there, I can't accurately answer that question, but I can speculate. Um, and Is there someone that was on the commission that can answer that question as to why the authors of the report were barred from further participation after they submitted their draft? I was on the commission. I wouldn't agree with the terminology that they were barred. Unfortunately, several weeks went by after their report was submitted uh, <clears throat> due to a staff person not prioritizing it and moving it along fast enough and then their contract time had expired. Okay, Ms. Uh, Ms. Wang's account is that they were prohibited from any further participation in the report after they, uh, after they initially submitted the draft. Do you dispute that account? Uh, I am not aware of anything in which they would have been prohibited or barred from okay. participating. If you could uh, verify that and get that information to the committee for the record, I'd appreciate I, it. I don't know if there's information I can get you. I'm just simply saying, as a member of the commission, I was not aware of anything that would have barred or prohibited them except for the fact that their contract had expired. Okay. Well, according to them, they were specifically prohibited, and the chair of the commission acknowledges that. <coughs> Who is Hans von, von, von Spakovsky, Madam Chair? Uh, Mr. Von Spakovsky is a... I believe, well, I don't know what his status is, a member of the F Federal Election Commission. Okay, did he direct that Tova Wang be taken off the assignment at the time? Did, uh, she have, did he have any involvement in her removal or, or participation in the assignment? Um, at the time, he was uh, on the EAC's Board of Advisors, and um, I have seen email, uh, email from him uh, expressing um, concern about her working on the project. Thank you. But he, but he, he certainly didn't direct the operations. But he did, he did express vocal concern and as a member of the EAC's advisory board about her participation. Email that I read, yes. Okay. So, um, and six months after they submitted their preliminary findings, the EAC released a report and it concluded that voter fraud was a matter of considerable debate directly in, con in, in contradiction to the draft report's findings. Is that correct? Uh, well. I, I'm going to ask Commissioner Hillman to, uh, if she would. Uh, Is that correct? Yes or no? The, the, the final report said there was a matter of considerable debate. The draft said the opposite. Correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> and the Commission still attached Ms. Wang's name to the report as well as Mr. Mr. Sarabroff, correct? Yes. Those, they, were, they were considered the authors and that it was reported as such. 
The report also, uh, excuse me, if I might, Congresswoman. Yes. No, the the report came out as an EAC report. We acknowledged that the research work had been conducted by Ms. Wang, and but they were but not the findings, written as the authors. Okay, but the findings were in direct contra contradiction to the authors, to the researchers, as you characterize them, to the researchers' findings, and you would still attach their names to the to the report. Um, the report also excluded much of the, of the discussion of voter intimidation that was in the draft, correct? If that's the case, then why? I'm sorry, will you repeat that question? The report also excluded much of the discussion of voter intimidation that was in the researchers' findings. Why did that happen? Um, I, I can't really do justice with that, my response to that question. That is something I would like to supplement after uh, Learning about. Were you on the commission at the time that the that the report was released? <coughs> no. Okay. Oh, at the time it was released. Yes. 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 Okay. Well, then you had a draft. You voted in favor of the release of the final report. You you saw the draft, which included the the voter intimidation information, and that was not included in the final report. I Why? was on the commission at the time that the draft was released at the suggestion of 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 this uh, committee, but I was not on the commission at the time. The revised or, uh, or the Is EAP. there anyone that was on the commission that can tell me why the information First. about voter intimidation was not in the final report? I was on the commission, but uh, Congresswoman, I would have to go back because I'm not sure which information you're referring to. Uh, and so my memory doesn't serve me to answer your question directly because I don't recall it that way. That's convenient. If you could please get me the information for the record and make sure that we have it. Um, it is not a matter of convenience, ma'am. It's a matter of human being. I don't remember okay. what happened two years there are ago a lot verbatim. Of, there are a lot of human beings that come before congressional committees and, and have lapses in memory. What was Mr. Von Spakovsky's role during this time? Anyone who was in, uh, on, actually on the commission? I mean, I have to forgive me for taking this a little bit personally. I'm a member of Congress that represents the state of Florida. Uh, the, the HAVA Act was, is the direct result of the debacle that took place in 2000. Your commission was created specifically to make sure that we protect the right to vote, that we enhance the right to vote, and that we make sure that, that every vote is uh, registered and counted. And you produce a suspect report that was dramatically rewritten, that you acknowledge was dramatically rewritten compared to what the, author, the, the, the author's draft w that, that was submitted. And uh, you're asking for a, a significant amount, millions of dollars, and the confidence of the American people, which is the purpose of your institution. And I'm really not sure how you expect the American people and this committee to give you those millions of dollars when you decided to make a, pol a, your, a, pol a, a report that should not have been politicized a totally political document. Please, that would be um, illuminating. When we asked for the report to be done, it, when we asked for it, we asked for a definition of what vote fraud and vote intimidation was. We also asked in the contract that they, uh, you know, as we went through it, what we asked for in the contract was not what we got. We, um, the, how should we move forward in the study is what we asked for. We did not ask for a conclusion. There was 24 people that was interviewed in that report, if I remember correctly, 24 or 27. Just, since, you're, since you're making that, that, that accusation or that suggestion, let me quote Job Sarabroff, the Republican who was, uh, the, the Republican elections lawyer who was commissioned to co-author the report. He said, Tova and I worked hard to produce a correct, accurate, and truthful, truthful report. Uh, a voting expert, uh, Mr. Sarabroff wrote, referring to Tova Wang, a voting expert with liberal leanings from the Century Foundation and co-author of the report, He's an elect a Republican elections lawyer from Arkansas. I could care less what, that the results are not what the more conservative members of my party wanted. He added, neither one of us was willing to conform results for political expediency. So you have a bi your bipartisan authors who differ with the commission's characterization of their work. You know, I, that's the reason why we put over 40,000 pieces of documents up on the website, the, everything that took place in that study. Unfortunately, only after and, Congress. Forced. And the contract, and we would be more than happy to provide you a copy with the contract showing what they had actually signed to. That would be great. Uh, um, Chairman, I know that my time uh, is, is expiring because I hear you banging, but the, um, the discomfort that I have is that the EAC was formed to help determine what 
problems in our nation's voting system existed um, and that we can have a more f accessible, fair, and accurate voting system. But I don't know how the Commission can do that unless it finds some reforms for itself. Mr. Chairman. Yield back. because I don't think the committee would be tolerant of, of that kind of behavior again. Uh, Could I inquire of the chairman? Yes. Given that you raised this issue in your opening statement as a concern, and the gentlelady from Florida has raised this question as well, w would it be fair to ask, I know my time has expired, but would it be fair to ask if there's concern that the report was delayed for a reason, was there political pressure put on uh, the Commission by the White House or by members of Congress or by other people that might have influenced this? Is that a, I, I know I'm the newest kid on the block, but is that not well, an that's appropriate a, that's question? That's a fair question that's been asked in the past. Uh, people have denied that kind of uh, a situation, but it was not uh, a pleasant thing that we had to deal with last year, and I, I can assure you that, that this committee, both the Chairman and the Ranking Member, would not be happy with that kind of behavior again, and want answers as to what happened then. Still, we keep asking those questions, but we are where we are now. Uh, Mr. Good, the thank you, Mr. Newest Chair. member of the committee from the great state of Virginia. Thank you. I appreciate it. That adjective Brooklyn of back for <laughs> the Virginia. Uh, thank each uh, commissioner for being here today. Let me ask you. Um, <clears throat> this a little bit about what y'all have been spending. Since the inception of the EAC, how much uh, federal money has been spent under HAVA? Six billion, seven billion, eight billion, nine billion, just kind of ballpark. No, sir, I would say less than four billion. About 3.2 billion went to the states directly as requirements payments um, and maybe uh, I, it's been way less than $4 billion because the EAC has received less than $60 million in the four years, in the fir right. first four budgets. So you spent $3.2 billion the first year in grants to the states to change or upgrade their voting equipment, correct? But there were three separate payments. One was early money for them to get their harvest state plans together and then to be able to replace the punch card and the lever machines. And then the second largest set of requirements payments was uh, sent out in 2004 and 2005. How much do you say the states had to spend of their own monies and local governments to match or do upgrades I'm not sure that we have that information, sir. They were required to do a 5 percent match. Some states have reported what they have spent beyond that 5 percent, yes. but that I information is not required for states to report to us, so we don't get that. What was the number one company in selling voting equipment to the states in terms of dollars, would you guess? I honestly don't know, sir. Anyone know? I don't know either. Now, the states purchased their own equipment, and um, I can't tell you which company would have sold the most equipment to the states. All right. So it'd be, depending on how much the states did spend, counting state money, federal money, and local money to make all the voting machine changes and everything, it was more than $4 billion ballpark and less than six. Counting state, state money and state local money. State money. Um, wow. If I'm ballparking, I'd say it was probably on the, just on what the state spent, not our operating right. budget. I would say maybe, maybe four billion. Maybe. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me just uh, remind folks that in my opening statement, I, I did uh, mention the fact that the IG is due to come out with a report on this particular issue that you had brought up and uh, about the procedures that were in place that might have led to this situation. So there is a pending IG report coming out, we understand, soon. Mr. Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for having to be late to the hearing. 
I always like to be on time. But I wanted to be here as much to uh, welcome my colleague and friend from Alabama, Joe Bonner, who happens to be from Lower Alabama. I'm from <laughs> North Alabama. And we're, we're part of the Alabama team, and, and I want to associate myself with the remarks of, of the ranking member and the chairman in, in welcoming Mr. Bonner to this right. particular subcommittee and to the full committee as well. Mr. Hinchy and I are from New York. <laughs> Just <laughs> to let you know. <laughs> I, 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 th I think I knew that, but <laughs> thanks for, for we did we did welcome. Him. Remind, I know you did, I know you did, but unfortunately I wasn't here at the time, and I apologize for making you endure that. Listen, I, I want to uh, give you the opportunity. I'm a, uh, a little late in 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 jumping into your issues here, but I want to give you the chance to respond to the issues that Ms. Was Wasserman Schultz and my colleague Joe Bonner from Alabama was proposing. Was there pressure put on you in any way whatsoever? On behalf of the commission, I, I will uh, thank the chair for mentioning the, the inspector general's report. We voted unanimously to investigate that matter. We await, nobody wants to see that report more than we do. I personally do not believe uh, that there was external pressure. I do believe that the research was mishandled. Um, that, How? Well, that, uh, Ms. Ms. Wang, uh, you know, there, I've seen, I've read all the emails. I mean, she clearly wanted to continue to to participate and contribute to the project, and it looked like uh, there wasn't a lot of response. Um, uh, we uh, may not have been clear in our statement of work uh, in in the parameters that we set down for relationship. Uh, I think that we, I know, we've learned a lot from from it as an agency. Um, I. I told the chair that I don't want to ever be accused of burying things or mishandling things. Um, and, and I speak for the commission. It was not uh, 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 where we wanted to be in, perceived by this uh, body at the time. Would, I would like the rest of you please to give a reaction to that. Um. <clears throat> Sir, I wasn't on the commission at the time that, that this report um, was being dealt with, but I will say that I agree with the comments of the chairwoman. We anxiously await that report. And from everything I can tell from the emails that I've read, there was no outside political pressure. And I believe Ms. Was, Ms. Wang even acknowledged as such in the article that the congresswoman refers to. I don't, I don't believe that there was any kind of political pressure in this regard. And I read the report several months ago, and from what I can tell, the conclusions that she calls research were based on interviews of approximately 26 people. And I don't know how you can draw sweeping national conclusions based on interviewing 26 people. Thank you. And, and particularly uh, the, the, the allegation that officials at the Justice Department were actively involved in the report throughout the process and even exerted some degree of editorial control over the new report. There was uh, a set two members, I believe it was, of the Department of Justice who are on the board of advisors of the Election Assistance Commission, and they're required to be on the board pursuant to the Help America Vote Act. So in their capacity as board members, they, they did weigh in on a couple of matters, yes. Well, weighing in is one thing, but controlling, dictating, exerting pressure, uh, you weren't on the commission, so you wouldn't know that. I'd like the rest of you to respond to Certainly, sir. Let me, uh, <clears throat> let me say that we did have a member, uh, a person from the Department of Justice who worked on the working group, the project under which Ms. Wang and, and Mr. Sarabov did the work, had a working group. And we did have someone from the Department of Justice who was on there. Um, and uh, our principal staff person on this project did uh, consult with him uh, periodically. What I would say as a member of this commission, two things. I personally never received any pressure from either side of the aisle with respect to the contents of the report, particularly not from the Justice Department. I was aware that uh, ex uh, uh, expressions of concern had been raised, partisan expressions of concern had been raised with respect to uh, Ms. Wang's participation. But I was not aware, and I did not receive any pressure. I do not believe our staff received any pressure. Irrespective of the participation of a representative from the Department of Justice uh, on the working group, 
Uh, I do not believe the Justice Department put pressure on our staff to change. However, I do look forward to the results of the Inspector General's report to tell me whether or not what I believed at the time I voted to release the information was correct or not. Well, it will be important for all of us to know what was spin spinning around this. Ms. Davidson, did you want to offer information? I, I agree uh, with everything that's been said. I was chair during that time, and I asked, because I brought it up, that I felt that we needed to go to uh, the IG and ask for a report to be done. And my colleagues voted unanimously to, uh, to back that. And so we all look forward to that. We expect it any time. We, we really thought it would be here before now. So as, as it moves forward, we have, I took a pledge myself of saying if there was anything in that report, we needed to change in our office. And we've already started changing uh, how we work through our process of con contracting. We, uh, GovWorks does our contracting. We don't do it ourselves individually now. So that is, it is actually out of our hands at the EAC. There is more of a protection there for the contractors as well as, uh, you know, the office of the EAC. So as we move forward, we are improving on how we, we learned a great deal, as we said, um, and we move forward to do a, a lot better job but I never received any contact from the Justice Department, the White House, from any colleague on any side uh, of pressure of how I should vote. Um, I never have. The only time I ever heard from the White House is that my name had, was going to be submitted to uh, the Senate for a confirmation. That's the last time I heard from him. So uh, I really feel that in uh, my review of the, the emails, I don't think the staff was uh, had any pressure put on them either, but we're anxiously waiting for that report to find out if and there was anything. specifically, if I have any time left, the Department of Justice uh, involvement, would you react to that? The Department of Justice, uh, I have only was contacted twice with the Department of Justice when I first came on. Uh, I went with Ray Martinez to a luncheon, uh, just a, a hello greeting. Uh, the second time after the report was done, I got an email from Hans Voskoski, which I as know is up on the internet. But it w I never responded to it, and that was after the report was done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Alexander. Mr. Kirk. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to sort of look at the past and look at the future. I remember uh, when my predecessor was retiring, a nice old gentleman came up to me and said, I want to apologize. And I said, why? And he said, I was the guy that stuffed the ballot in 1978 to make sure that your predecessor lost his first chance for election. And uh, later on, he turned out to be a good congressman. And, uh, and so uh, I just want to apologize because I think uh, John Porter was a good guy. It was, you know, I come from Chicago. We know these things, but uh, it's a, it was a sort of a disheartening moment uh, to, uh, to go through. Uh, with all the money that you have, uh, what about uh, just uh, assuring the American people also the integrity of the process? Uh, and I want to uh, take a moment to look forward. Is there an EIC policy on, you know, people convicted of federal felonies and to get that out to the states? Is, is there a policy on dead people, uh, uh, foreign citizens voting, uh, people who we actually know are under the age of 18? Um, Double jurisdiction voters, something that we see a lot of, you know, voting in the city and then coming out and voting in, in, in another place. Um, anything on that to uh, upgrade our standards and make sure in, in the work of the commission? As uh, Chairwoman Rodriguez mentioned earlier, the Help America Vote Act does have a verification requirement at the front end when, when voters submit their voter registration form. So that hopefully will, will help in, in some respect to the concerns that you raise. Um, another thing is that the Election Assistance Commission has commissioned a study with the National Academies of Sciences. And we're hoping that that study assists states in doing proper matching procedures so that they're able to use their voter registration list and match it up against the file, the records of persons who are deceased, for example, and to ensure that they're matching the proper people before that person is removed. But 
Of course, federal law does require that states have a list maintenance program, and unfortunately, many states have not done that list maintenance. And so several states have come to us and said, we need help in this regard. We'd like some national standards, and that's why the EAC entered into the contract with the National Academy of Science. So we're hoping that, that what comes out of that contract will assist in some of the areas you've mentioned. Uh, I, I would just think, though, for example, we have a list of federal felons federal government. Has that ever been sort of provided to the states or? Not to my knowledge. Yeah, the I states have a variety of laws about felon voting and the rights of felons um, that, that uh, we have no control over. But no data assistance on that point? No. You guys. Um, there, uh, um, can Social, Social Security Administration obviously know who's dead because you got to stop the checks. Yes, HAVA requires the states now with their new voter registration systems to check with the, the vital statistics to make sure that they have the deceased off of their list. It also requires that they go through the justice to make sure if they can meet their state laws, whether it's a felon or, or what the case might be. Um, so the HAVA has put in some requirements for the states with their voter registration systems to improve upon the areas that you are talking about. I just say that because in my district, for example, two dead guys resurrected themselves. One dead guy voted uh, or signed election petitions twice uh, before the Super Tuesday elections. So the process of resurrection is very active in my area. Uh, and uh, just wondering if there's any way you can help. Hopefully, as the states move forward in developing of their statewide voter registration um, list and, and uh, doing that process, we're hoping that that will definitely correct everything. And as we said, we're also doing the study and uh, how they actually take names off the list. If there's duplicates within the state, as you mentioned, they could be registered in more lo one location. So they are, we are moving forward in, in trying to assist the states in the best practices. What about, it, it uh, has more of a federal bent. What about a double jurisdiction voter? <laughs> Happens to... Um, Vote in the city, get on the train, and then vote somewhere else, same day. Well, obviously, that is one of the things that really is looked at after the election. If something like that has occurred, that uh, then any election, and it depends on the state and their state law, whether it is sent to the district attorney or whether it is sent to the judge at the county level. But uh, election uh, through the process of their state laws, those types of things is handled after the election and prosecuted instead of before. But for the, the commission, no significant work on any of these five areas? It, it, as we said, it is being studied currently at the uh, Academy and National Science. And so that those are all things that, that we are studying and making sure how the states are doing their statewide voter registration systems. Have any of the studies been published since? Any action? On, on any action on the I'm looking for anything substantive you've done on the subject where actual action has been taken besides just studying. Well, the, the states are working on developing, and some of them are already developed, the statewide voter registration. No, no I'm thinking for the 37 million we gave you guys. Of what we have done? Well, we have. A preliminary draft of the uh, National Academy of Sciences study that Commissioner Hunter referred to right. will be available in April. In April. <coughs> And that's the first action. Yes, if you would call it an action. <laughs> Nothing else. Um, we, I, I think if you looked at our authorizing um, statute, you probably wouldn't find much in there for us to. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Hinch. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank you for uh, your proposal to make it clear that. Uh, states could use HABA funds to purchase additional equipment if they have no competence or less competence than that which they have already purchased. I think that's a very important <laughs> step, and uh, I hope that uh, you will endorse it and uh, make sure that those kinds of things are allowed to happen. The problem with the Help America Vote Act is it should have been the Help America Vote Accurately Act because it is, in my opinion, undermining the accuracy of voting across the country. At the very least, it has that very serious potential to do so. 
and I think there are many places where, uh, where that is actually taking place. And we need to be very, very focused on, uh, on this issue. We need to make sure that the elections in this country are reliable. If they're not reliable and the people of this country begin to become unhappy and uncertain with that reliability, we are going to see a major disruption in the whole political process here. So this is a very critical issue. And that uh, Help America Vote Act, I think, has been a big mistake, and uh, particularly in the way that it is open to potential corruption of the election process. And I'm, I'm deeply concerned about that. Over uh, the last period of time since the act has come into uh, effect, there have been several districts across the country that have reported specifically numerous problems with uh, electronic voting equipment. These uh, problems occurred in primaries in New Jersey, Georgia, South Carolina, and, and, a, and a few other places. There have also been several reports that have been issued, including a report by the Government Accounting Service, which states that state elections officials in California, Colorado, Ohio, Florida, Alaska, Kentucky, and a number of other places have been raising concerns about the security and the reliability of electronic voting machines. I want to ask why is it that the uh, EAC is not taking a more aggressive, more proactive stance in dealing with this issue, this issue at least uh, being a, a receptor or a sounding board for these actions. What are you doing? How are you responding to this? Congressman, two things that, that we have done, in, and I mentioned this in my opening comments, we are working on the next iteration of the voluntary voting system guidelines, and those guidelines will be for the future of voting. So that doesn't answer your question. Yeah, I understand no, no, I know. that. That's right. That's, that's fine. You can do that. But the point is we've got to deal with the situation right. now. And you have the evidence of problems, and you have the states stipulating those problems, telling you about their concerns. It's your job. It's your responsibility to deal with these issues and make sure that if there are problems in the voting system, that they're corrected immediately. It, it's our responsibility to ensure that systems that have been certified by the Election Assistance Commission you know, are properly maintained, that they work, that there's no problems. However, at this point, there are no systems that have been certified by the Election Assistance Commission. So, of course, there's some lag time no, in between. No, but there are systems that have, been, that have been promoted, that have been pushed, in effect. A lot not of the electron, oh, yes, they have. A lot of the, ele I'm not saying that you did it specifically, mm -hmm. but a lot of, there's been a lot of pushing on these electronic voting machines, and a lot of people bought into them. And now they understand that there are serious problems associated with them. They're responding to these serious problems. And they're calling upon the responsible federal agency to try to do something about it. You are the responsible federal agency. What are you doing about it? We have a policy that states that either a state or local election official can send to us their experience with voting systems. And we post that on our website so that states can share information amongst ones, one another to learn what problems they've had in other jurisdictions. So we, we are doing that as part of our clearing Very, very role. passive, very, very relaxed, not with any intention to bring about corrections. Let me just ask you another question. I mean, I see the answer to that question. The answer is no, you're not doing anything. And that is, that is I think, potentially We're deeply not. tragic, and we are going to have to address that. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to address it to some extent within the context of the appropriations process. But let me ask you another. Are there currently any voting systems in the field that have been certified by the EAC? No. No. None. Do you have any oversight? Are you examining them? Do you have any intention of issuing certifications? Do you have any intention of issuing um, concerns about the accuracy, the reliability of these systems? No. No. I mean, that we don't have the authority to do so, sir. And the only authority that we have is when a machine has been brought to the EAC for certification. There are eight systems <laughs> right now that have been brought to the EAC for certification under our program. Well, I, w I would disagree with you on the first sentence that you just said there, that you don't have any authority. I think you do have authority. I'm sure you have authority. Hmm. When you see that there are problems, when people are bringing problems to your attention, when states are stepping forward and say, we had problems with these primaries, when other states are stepping forward, when you have ins inspection agencies which are stepping forward, bringing all of this matter to, to public attention, I don't think it's, you, it's, it's anything that you can do to just relax and be passive about it. You've got to be more aggressive. You've got to step forward. You're the agency that was set up by HAVA to deal with these issues. 
Mr. Hinchy, if I might add, um, on the issue of the machines, Hava set the EAC up to be relatively small. I mean, heck, we were kicked to the curb the first year we were in existence right. by not being able to operate. People have very high expectations of what EAC can do. And earlier we were asked by Ms. Kilpatrick as to what do we need. If Congress wants EAC to be ready to go into the field to investigate problems with machines and to be able to come up with recommendations, then we need a staff and resources to do that. We have 30 people on staff, and quite frankly, with the many responsibilities and mandates we have, I would agree with you, it would be great. I would also say to you, sir, I don't think the states would agree that we have that authority because the states have been told, you purchase the HAVA compliant equipment, you choose to purchase, you choose the certification process you want to go through, whether you're going to go through the national or your own state certification process. It's all voluntary, sir. So we can be aggressive, but my fear is aggressiveness on words without the authority to follow up isn't going to produce the results that I hear you uh, suggesting you need to see. that you be aggressive. And I know you were kicked. No. I know you were kicked to the curb, and I know who kicked you to the <laughs> curb. And I know the effects that that has had. No, I mean I aggressive about following up, being well, able to well, follow up immediately. You need to follow up. Right. We you don't have you the capacity. That, if you want to put that follow up in the form of aggressiveness, then please be well, my guest. Well, we you don't have the capacity. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, then you, ought to, you, then you better make that clear, that you don't have the capacity, you don't have the ability to do it, and you better make it clear what the problems are, because they need to be dealt with. And if you can't do it, somebody else is going to have to. Thank you. We are running somewhat behind, and we have yet another panel to come. Let me finish up in two ways, by thanking all the members for a fine line of questioning, thanking you for your presentations. But I am going to very loudly disagree with you. You do have a hammer. It's called a bully pulpit. If the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the local Des Moines uh, Gazette, if there's such a thing, publishes that you folks said something is not right with the way to run the next elections. You have power beyond the power you think you have. If you say to this country, especially now with the exci excitement surrounding this election season, that something doesn't look right, I don't think you realize how powerful that is and how people will start jumping through hoops to make it right. Secondly, you say you don't have resources, but we did treat the commission fairly, and this chairman, along with the support of Mr. Regula, made sure that you were a priority. Absolutely. And we fought some folks who wanted to cut you down to the bare bones. This ranking member and this chairman did not. We gave you $16 million for the commission, but we gave you $125 million to carry out some of your work with the states. We intend to try to be as helpful as we can again. You are a top priority for us. So it breaks my heart when I have you as a top priority for protection, and then you tell me you have no power. Use, I, I, I don't want to respond on this. This is my farewell to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> use it, you have it. It's called the bully pulpit. If members of Congress use it all the time. What Mr. Hinchy just did, did in his questioning, <coughs> what Ms. Wasserman Schultz did in her questioning, did not necessarily change anything right now, but it will be reported on, it will be mentioned. I told you, you have bully pulpit, use it. But you have to have the intention and the desire to use it. Because what you have at hand, and I've always said this, you're a small agency probably that's gonna become one of the most important agencies in our government. Because you have in your hands the ability to tell the country how to conduct fairer and accurate elections. And if what we hear every day on TV from right-wingers and left-wingers is true, there is nothing more important to us than our democratic process and our electoral process. So go out there and raise hell. We will support you on behalf of a fair and accurate count. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. When Mr. Regular. Uh, is it your experience generally that the states are receptive because they do have the primary responsibility. Are they generally receptive 
to working with you to improve the process. I, may I? Um, uh, that um, ch varies from year to year. Um, one of the organizations um, voted on a resolution to do away with the commission a, a year ago. So um, when we, we don't have a heavy hand, they're very receptive. Um, when we exert uh, too much force, uh, I, I think they're less receptive. Don't feel too bad about that. If you took a vote on whether to have a Congress or not, you might be surprised <laughs> on the vote. So. But we're not going to ask that question. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. Chairman, might I say thank you. I heard you say that you've got our back, and I want to thank you for that. Yes, we do. For us, as Mr. Rangel would say, I'm with you for as long as I can stay with you. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Only kidding. <laughs> we have your back. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I want to thank the first panel for their testimony. We'll now turn to our second panel of witnesses. And we will try to at least get through opening statements before the next series of votes. This panel has Wendy Weiser from the Brennan Center for Justice. She will lead off. Then Susan Euron from the Pew Charitable Trust, followed by Arturo Vargas from the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials Educational Fund, and Jeff Matthews from the Board of Elections in Stark County, Ohio. There you go. Your district? <laughs> So since you are accepting the fact that he's from your district, let me say that I am a member of the Latino, um, of Naleo. Uh, you don't join, you're kind of born into it, kind of, you know, once you get elected. And we welcome everyone <laughs> to this panel. We will hear from you first, Ms. Weiser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of this committee for holding this <coughs> important hearing. Um, my testimony will um, address the oversight that is needed to ensure that the EAC lives up to its charge and helps ensure effective election administration this year. I have submitted detailed written testimony, and so today I'll focus principally on the urgent need to reform the way in which the agency operates. Um, I will hopefully briefly address also things we believe the Commission can and should do this year to um, improve election administration. I should remind this panel also, in case you weren't in the room, that your full testimony will go into the record, and we hope you stay within the five-minute rule. Okay. Thank you. So, um, uh, the EAC is in charge of some of the most critical um, uh, election administration tasks, from distributing much-needed HAVA funds to the states, developing standards for voting systems, overseeing the certification and testing of voting systems, collecting data, can, um, and conducting election reform research, and administering um, federal, the federal mail and voter registration form. And for our elections to run smoothly, it is essential that these tasks be executed <coughs> well. And unfortunately, there are now two major barriers to this happening. Um, the first is the lack of adequate resources in the agency, and the second is a, a lack of transparent operating procedures for virtually all of the agency's operations. And um, as, uh, um, uh, as Commissioner um, Rodriguez mentioned, um, two days ago after I submitted my written testimony, um, the EAC's independent inspector general um, released an audit of the agency's program and financial operations. And um, I, it bears um, quoting some of what the audit found. Um, it found that the agency lacks um, policies and procedures in all program areas to document governance and accountability structure and practices in place. It lacks appropriate and effective internal controls, a clear organizational structure, and strategic plans. The, uh, the audit documents in detail the fact that the EC does not have any standard policies or procedures for virtually any of its functions. 
And, and this confirms our longstanding uh, concern that the agency appears to um, function at times in an ad hoc manner without the transparency, consistency, and accountability expected of a public agency. And, and these are serious um, failings and ones with significant consequences. They make the agency's work less effective, and they undermine the public's confidence in the agency. And um, there are two incidents from last uh, election cycle that illustrate the problem. Um, the first um, is the one that was discussed at length in the question and answers for the last panel concerning the EAC's mishandling of the voter ID and voter fraud reports. Um, and for the reasons that this subcommittee has already elucidated, this incident shook um, the public confidence in the agency because there was simply no good reason to withhold research on matters of public concern commissioned from established experts with taxpayer dollars um, under statutory mandate to make available to the public studies on election administration issues. And worse, this was withheld at a time when the, um, at virtually all levels of government, these issues of voter ID and voter fraud were being um, discussed, including in, in this House. And the public mistrust was magnified not only by the, the conduct and, and what happened with the report, but also by the fact that the EAC had absolutely no policies um, or procedures in place for making the decisions that it made or managing its research. And its action therefore seemed ad hoc and arbitrary or to some even worse um, designed to suppress information. And, and this controversy really could have been avoided if the EAC had in place fair and transparent tra standardized procedures that everyone agreed on in advance um, for um, and that were um, subject to fair research protocols, but it did not. And uh, another incident that um, uh, similarly undermined public concern um, and addressed at length in my testimony was the agency's handling of the, um, its assessment of cyber, um, one of the uh, um, laboratories at um, accredited voting um, machines. And um, this was another report that was withheld despite the fact that the agency had decided to um, not to accredit this agency, and despite the fact that at least um, the state of New York was using that agency, that laboratory, to test its voting um, machines. Now, while the EAC has taken some steps um, in recently to address some of these issues, these deficiencies still infect um, virtually all aspects of the agency's operations. And so we therefore urge this subcommittee to continue to, provi to provide oversight to make sure that the agency implements appropriate reforms, in including those recommended by the Inspector General and, and in our testimony. But at the same time, we urge Congress to provide the EAC with sufficient resources to undertake this um, important task and to get its house in order and to fulfill its many essential statutory functions. The fact remains that the EAC's work is critical to our elections, and it needs the resources to do that work effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Serrano, Ranking Member Regula, and other members of the committee for holding this important hearing and inviting me to address some of the challenges facing U.S. elections. As Managing Director of the Peace Center on the States, uh, part of the Peace Critical Trust, I oversee an initiative called called Make Voting Work, which seeks to significantly improve the accuracy, convenience, efficiency, and security of U.S. elections. The challenge for state and local election officials, for those who control their budgets, and for policymakers in state and federal, in state legislatures and in Congress, is to ensure that elections reflect the way that Americans now lead their lives and take advantage of some of the modern, uh, some of the advances that have transformed modern society, and that the answers to fundamental questions about the performance of elections can be answered with clarity. Elections today fail to reflect the convenience and efficiency that characterize other interactions that, that define our lives. If you move, your registration doesn't follow you. If you want to register online, you cannot unless you live in Arizona or Washington State. If you want to vote at a polling place near your office rather than one near your home, in all but a handful of states, you can't. If you're one of six million military and overseas citizens, you are faced with a complex and conflicting set of state rules and regulations when it comes to requesting, receiving, and returning ballots. And if you want information about any of this, how to register, where to vote, what's on the ballot, or if your vote is counted, it either isn't available <coughs> online, or if it is, it's not very easy to find. Unfortunately, the field of election administration has too often been unable to muster the resources and the expertise needed to meet these challenges. Now, changing this dynamic will require testing improvements in how we run elections, building a body of evidence, and sharing those results broadly to inform state and local policies. Make Voting Work, with support from the Jet Foundation, is proud to be working in partnership with election officials, the private sector, academics, and others to test some of the most promising innovations in several states. 
Pew has invested $20 million in this arena to date, and this is only part of a multi-year, multi-million dollar commitment on the part of the board to really build the evidence base we so desperately need in this area. Now, given our limited time, I'll highlight just one of our projects, and if the committee will allow, we'll put the full announcement of our first awards into the record. In Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana, the Secretaries of State have joined together to test the use of change of address forms to improve the registration process, offer voters a convenient way to update their registration, and hopefully reduce costs to state and local governments. Recognizing that 40 million Americans move every year, the National Association of Secretaries of State has adopted a resolution at their national conference this month calling for an expansion of this approach. Creative projects like this should encourage us to take an, entire new, an entirely new look at conventional practices and think about where we can transform the outdated elements of our election system. Field test experiments that point the way to a more portable registration system are an important step forward. But rather than applying Band-Aids, it may be time to create a voter registration system where states would have a comprehensive list of all the voters. Registration would seamlessly follow those who move. Ineligible names could not be added to the list and information would be managed reliably. And then we have the issue of data. Sound policy making and effective management practices for election are built on data. Data that allow us to assess the performance of our election systems. Gaps in the EAC election day survey currently are so severe that it is nearly impossible to consistently monitor state compliance with key provisions of the NVRA and UACAVA. We don't have a good handle on how many Americans are registered to vote, how many have been moved to inactive lists, or how many show up at polling places for each federal election. The EAC must, assu must assure that the election day survey meets the highest standards of quality data collection, and they need to take a leadership role in setting standards for the kinds of data we'll need to collect over the next decade. With good data that reaches down to the precinct level, because that's the unit of analysis necessary for meaningful comparison, one could determine the impact of a new voting system on accuracy, whether any new early voting policy reduces election day stress, how the number, age, and training of poll workers relates to election performance, which voters take advantage of new registration methods such as online registration applications or change of address forms, how a new voter identification law affects an election. This kind of data would allow your committee to better evaluate the impact of the Help America Vote Act and the over $3 billion in federal funding. The committee has taken a positive first step by funding $10 million in new state data collection efforts to be administered through the EAC. And thank you, Chairman Serrano, for your leadership in securing this funding. Collecting information on the state of our elections is a critical element of the EAC's mandate to serve as a clearinghouse of information about elections in the states. We firmly believe that the five states that receive funding under this new program will set the gold standard for how to assess election performance, and we hope that requests for proposals receive the, the attention that they deserve from secretaries of state and state election directors. However, the success of this pilot is also dependent on the EAC. The data collection program should receive the highest priority. They should ensure that states receive the support they need to submit competitive applications and that participating states set aggressive data collection goals, including collecting high quality precinct level data. I urge the committee to hold an oversight hearing this summer on the data collection program. At that point, after the grants for the data collection program are awarded and the 2008 election day survey is released, the committee will be able to hear from the selected states about their plans and from the EAC on how they have refined the survey to ensure that it collects the information needed to assess the performance of state election systems. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and I look forward to future opportunities to talk about make voting work and welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Vargas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Regula. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you. The Nile Educational Fund has been at the forefront of efforts to ensure that federal election reform enhances opportunities for full participation by all our citizens. We believe that there must be a comprehensive effort involving federal, state, local, community-based organizations, and the private sector to eliminate barriers to voting and to promote voter engagement. Voters with limited English proficiency continue to face barriers in obtaining information about voting and elections. We urge the Department of Justice to continue to vigorously enforce the Voting Rights Act language assistance provisions. We commend the EAC for publishing its glossary of key election terminology, and we recommend, we recommend that the EAC conduct an assessment of how this glossary is being used. This will be important as the release of the Census Bureau's American Community Survey, ACS data, approaches in 2010. The Voting Rights Act requires that the ACS data be used every five years to determine which jurisdictions are required to provide language assistance during elections, and that next determination will occur in 2010. 
It is likely that several jurisdictions will be subject to the VRA's language assistance requirements for the first time, and the EAC will need to help them meet this challenge. When Congress enacted HAVA, the legislation included provisions which required certain first-time voters to provide ID. Recently, there has been an increase in state efforts to impose proof of citizenship and voter ID requirements that go far beyond the federal mandates. We believe that these measures make it more difficult for citizens to register to vote and greatly increase the risk that eligible voters will be denied the right to vote. We believe the EAC should take stronger action to discourage states from imposing proof of citizenship or voter ID requirements that go beyond the scope of HAVA. We are aware that Arizona has asked the EAC to amend the federal mail voter registration form to incorporate state-specific instructions reflecting Arizona's proof of citizenship requirement. We urge the EAC to reject this request. We are also aware of the controversy over two reports commissioned by the EAC related to voter ID issues and voter fraud, the voter fraud one which was extensively discussed by the earlier panel and the members of the committee. We are deeply concerned about the possibility that the, voter, that the election fraud report's conclusions were altered. We are also disappointed that the EAC did not adopt the report on voter identification, which found that Latino voters were 10% less likely to vote in states that required non-photo ID. We hope that the more comprehensive review the agency has initiated will assess the impact of the more restrictive photo ID requirements imposed by some states. And we look forward to the results of the review that will be conducted by the Inspector General. With regard to direct electronic voting systems, uh, we believe these hold advantages over older paper-based systems to ensure that votes are accurately counted. DREs can be programmed to provide ballot screens in multiple languages where required, which is more cost-effective and efficient than paper voting materials. DREs are also particularly useful for voters with disabilities because they provide them with the right to cast a vote privately and independently. We understand the concerns that ver voter verified paper trail capabilities are necessary to maintain public confidence, and we are pleased that manufacturers are developing new technology that will provide these capabilities for DRE systems. However, manufacturers should ensure that the v voter verified paper trail technology needs to have us accessibility requirements for persons with disabilities and for language minorities. Now, Latinos voters face special, challenge, face special challenges when they participate in the electoral process. They often do not have access to information about the basic mechanics of registering and casting the ballot. When jurisdictions do not have well-administered election procedures, they often fail to maintain correct data about Latinos on their voter for rolls, and they fail to provide Latinos with election materials in a timely manner. Among callers to our national hotline during the past two general elections, we found that less than half of Latino registered voters reported having received any information from their election officials. We also found that voters who are not yet fully proficient in English were more likely to experience problems with obtaining information from their jurisdictions. Jurisdiction, jurisdictions need to scrutinize every aspect of the registration and voting process to ensure that there are quality control measures for effective election administration. States need to carefully examine their procedures for maintaining voter databases and processing DMV registrations to ensure that all eligible registrants are added to the uh, voter rolls in a timely manner. There should be an assessment of best practices providing in providing voters with basic registration and voting information. We understand the EAC is undertaking a study of voter hotlines operated by election offices, and we urge the agency to conduct a more expansive study of overall voter education efforts. With regard to, po we're, with regard to poll workers, we believe jurisdictions should provide more comprehensive training, uh, specifically with regard to the needs and rights of language minority voters and those with disabilities and the non-discriminatory application of voter ID requirements. The training should also cover HAVA's requirement that voters be provided with the opportunity to cast a provisional ballot. Many callers to our hotline report not having been offered a provisional ballot or found that poll workers were not familiar with them, and in some cases our callers were not able to cast any ballot because of these problems. Finally, election officials should establish partnerships with CBOs that, that serve population groups who are underrepresented in the electoral process. CBOs can provide invaluable assistance in nearly every aspect of election administration. States and localities can establish CBO partnerships by creating advisory panels or committees, which include CBO representatives. Some jurisdictions, such as the County of Los Angeles, have ongoing committees that meet regularly with election officials, and this allows for troubleshooting of problems. We urge the EAC to conduct an assessment of best practices 
in developing and maintaining CBO and election official partnerships. Lastly, there is a need for nonpartisan CBO voter engagement and education efforts in underrepresented communities. The traditional mobilization approaches of parties and candidates produce short-term increases in turnout among certain select groups of voters. They do not aim to create the long-term fundamental changes in voter attitudes and behaviors that are needed to ensure that underrepresented groups become full participants in the electoral process. Only a few states offered HAVA funding to non-governmental groups for nonpartisan voter education. Most states tended to use HAVA funding for already established activities conducted by government agencies. Thus, the private sector, including corporations and foundations, should explore ways to generate more resources for nonpartisan CBO voter information and engagement work that targets underrepresented communities. As jurisdictions move forward with implementing HAVA, we urge the EAC to provide them with the guidance that enables them to embrace the opportunity to make significant improvements in the accessibility of election systems for Latinos and the nation as a whole. We stand ready to work with this committee and the EAC in ensuring that all of our citizens have an access to the voting process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Vargas. Mr. Matthews. Good afternoon, Chairman Serrano, Ranking Member Regula, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss a few election administration issues from the local perspective. Election officials in Ohio and elsewhere are a diverse community of individuals with one thing in common, a desire to serve the voter. Because of our diversity, I'm not attempting to speak for the entire elections community, but to merely provide my own opinions based upon my experiences. The consensus after the 2000 election was that something needed to be done to improve elections in the United States. The Help America Vote Act was the result. Although it was crafted over a period of two years and provided much needed funds to upgrade equipment, the time frame for impl implementation was perhaps rushed as evidenced by recent appeals for another overhaul or new equipment. In Ohio, there was much debate about implementation and deployment was delayed until November of 2005 due to the Ohio General Assembly's requirement of a voter verified paper audit trail on all direct recording voting equipment. In addition, Ohio requires the voter verified paper audit trail to be the official ballot of record for recount purposes. There have been some widely reported instances of problems with the printing of the voter verified paper audit trail due to paper jams or the paper being loaded backwards. This has raised questions about whether some voters could be disenfranchised because Ohio law doesn't specifically address this issue. This issue. However, all DRE equipment has a capability to recreate either a ballot image or another VPAT. In Stark County, we have conducted nine recounts since deployment in 2005. These recounts have included candidates and issues. In every single instance, the recount has verified the results from the official certification. Because the VPAT was an afterthought and not part of the original design of the units currently deployed, any federally mandated, mandated voter verified paper audit trail requirements should go into effect only after the Election Assistance Commission has developed standards for the function on and operation of this technology. Also, also widely reported was Ohio's second round of testing of its voting equipment, which was federally and state certified prior to purchase. Ohio Secretary of State Jennifer Bruner commissioned a study the evaluation and validation of election-related equipment standards and testing report, known as Everest is a comprehensive review of all voting equipment currently deployed throughout the state. The Ohio study tested the systems for risks to vote security, system performance including load capacity, configuration to currently certified systems specifications, and operations and internal controls that could mitigate risk. The $1.9 million study paid for using federal funds was structured to allow two teams of scientists corporate and academic, to conduct parallel assessment of the security of the state's voting systems. The researchers in the Ohio study didn't address the issue of probability of attack, leaving that to the determination of state and local officials. The researchers commented that with the lack of technical measures in voting system design, its integrity is provided purely by the integrity and honesty of election officials. Although I do not embrace all of the recommendations 
recommendations as the result of the Everest project, I do commend the Secretary for a concern with election integrity. I have been asked my, for my reaction to the various studies conducted for the Everest project. My thoughts are best reflected in the executive summary of the SysTest Lab's risk assessment study of Ohio voting systems. Beginning with the fourth full paragraph on page three, the solutions to election administration issues, voter confidence, and the security and integrity of elections are not to be found solely in technology. Regardless of the thoughtfulness and thoroughness of a design, the complexities and costs associated with creating systems that are 100% secure solely on their own is unrealistic. True security is a combination of technology-related security techniques and security measures found in thoughtful, well-documented policies, procedures, and processes for internal controls that are reflective of both a specific locality and a specific voting system. Ohio, like many other states, has a voter ID law which has been and is currently being litigated. For election day voting purposes, Ohio requirements are, are as follows. A current and valid photo identification, that is an Ohio driver's license, state ID, government ID. Photo identification must show name and address, although the address does not need to be current for the driver's license. A military identification that would show a name and address, or a copy of a current utility bill, including a cell phone bill, a bank statement, a government check, a paycheck, or other government document that shows the voter's name and current address, including if it's from a public college or university. Voters who do not provide one of these documents are still able to vote by provisional ballot and then are given 10 days to provide uh, that information. Obviously, this debate is shaped by two contrary ideological positions, fac facilitating the ease of voting compared to the need to secure the election process. What is needed in all of these laws is to strike a balance between the right to vote with the state's interest in securing free and fair elections. In conclusion, the AAC provides a valuable resource to state and local election officials. Real problems versus politically manipulated and reported problems demand and deserve our attention. The EAC is the best entity for the compilation of this data. If documented problems rise to a sufficient level of concern, then the EAC should inform Congress of these facts and help facilitate a remedy. These remedies, if needed, should be broad in scope, outlining goals and objectives, and then implemented at the state and local level. It is my opinion that the role of Congress should be to outline goals and objectives in election matters and not specifics, because with the diversity of the election jurisdictions, it is very difficult to craft a one-size-fits-all solution to very complex election issues. Thank you for your invitation to speak to you today. Thank you all for fine presentations. We have five minutes left on a series, the first of the three votes. The second vote's a five-minute vote, and the third vote is a five-minute vote. So we will get back here as quickly as we can. We ask the panel to please stay so we can join in the questioning. Thank you. Good job, by the way. Oh, thank you. Good job. Obviously, my name. <laughs>